Okay, everyone. All right. Thank you for joining. Parsha in my life, Parsha's Kedoshim Shir. Anybody that wants to dedicate this class, it can be dedicated. Last week, someone dedicated because they listened to the Shir and they heard there was no dedication and dedicated. So that's a big bracha for them. Anybody that's interested, please let me know. It's the biggest chus because it's not announced by the Shir. It's announced, it's, it's, so it has the element of it being pure. All right. Um, this week's Torah portion is Parshas Kedoshim, and it's very special because usually we have two Torah portions going together, Achrei Mos and Kedoshim, and this week we can give individual attention to such an important Parsha. Rashi says that this Parsha, the introduction to the Parsha is Daber Okol Adas Bnei Yisrael, speak to the entire assembly of the Jewish people. I think that's the word. I don't have a chumash in front of me. I think it says David al kol adas bnei Yisrael. Um, that and and the emphasis over here is that we're asking that Moshe should gather all the Jewish people. Everybody should be gathered together. Um, why? So Rashi says is because this parsha was said bahakel. This shot parsha was said by the assembly of all the Jewish people. In other words, everybody was gathered: men, women, and children. Verses. Other times when Moshe spoke, it looks like not every single person showed up to Moshe's shear, to Moshe's deliverance of the word of God. But this one was, and Rashi says, why? Because over here, there's so many, not just mitzvahs in Parshas Kedoshim, but so many core <coughs> principles, mitzvahs that are core principles of Judaism. The one famous one is love your fellow as you love yourself. So that's like a principle, a foundation of all of Judaism. And that's why Hashem didn't want even one Jew should be missing. Moshe should speak all the Jewish people. That means every all the, all the parshios are important. Parshas Kedoshim is super important. Um, the other powerful mitzvah, which we'll talk about, is that you shall be holy. Well, that's not just a detail. That describes an entire way of life, holiness. And obviously through the keeping of Torah and mitzvahs, we... We, we, we become a holy people, but that's already the detail. Then there is a general mitzvah to be a holy person. So, um, so these are just examples of how Parsha's Kedoshim is not just a Parsha, but it's a very, it's a very fundamental Parsha. It's a core Parsha. As, and that's why all the Jewish people are required to be there. So and that's why this year is nice because this year we, we get to spend <coughs> an entire seven days focusing on Parshas Kedoshim without it being shared with Parshas Acharemos, which most years it's shared with another Parsha. This year, it's and for us, it's Parshas Kedoshim. In Eretz Yisrael, it's actually the next Parsha already, Parshas Emro, but for us, it's Parshas Kedoshim. Which leads us to the question, which I'm just thinking about right now, when Moshiach comes this week, and uh, we will all go to Eretz Yisrael, and so we will be, and there's Parshas Emor, what's going to happen with all the Jewish people who didn't read yet Parshas Kedosh? So for instance, I remember two years ago when I was in Eretz Yisrael, also Shabbos after Pesach, a few years ago, when we went with our special Baal Shem Tov Sefer Torah, um, and it was Parshas Achare Mos was the first Shabbos, but in Israel it was Parshas Kedosh. So I remember that we had to have special minion, a special minion by the Kotel, which I was davening Shachar Shabbos over there, and that was being made for Yidin that were from Chutzliars, that for them it was Achare. So they read Achare, even though everybody was reading Kedoshim, because you can't miss a parsha. Or I think maybe we heard both, I don't remember exactly. So my question is going to be, when Mashiach comes, and we're all going to go, so I would imagine that the Yidin that came from Chutzliars are going to have to have their own minyanim, catching up on Achare, Mos, and Kedoshim. Now, by the way, if Mashiach is... A very real thing that you're expecting every second, then these questions come up always in your mind. The Rebbe taught us to live that way, living on the edge, to always think that Mashiach is happening the next moment. And then this becomes a real practical question. What happens? Shabbat's going to come. We're going to be in it. It's going to be with Achrei Mos and it's just and so on and so forth. Yesterday I had a funny story just to share. I sometimes laugh at myself of how ridiculous I'm becoming. <laughs> It's, I'm not upset because it's, it should only grow on me. It should only become more and more and more of an obsession. But yesterday I was over here. We, we had a special Rosh Chodesh davening. And um, I was the chazan. Um, you know, I, I'm not the sing, the big uh, one to sing. We had Rabbi, uh, we had Moshe Storch with us and he led us in a beautiful hall. 
Uh, but afterwards, we davened the Mosaf, and I was the chazan. And um, at the conclusion of it, the chazan, the davening, I was reading loud, um, you know, the Enka Lekenu. And Enka Lekenu concludes with the Parsha of Ketores, you read. After Enka Lekenu, before Elenu. And in the midst, I just yelled out, you know, unthinking, not with any intentional thought. I, you know, I was saying the words quietly, but I got to this part, I just yelled it out loud, Melach Sadomis. Now, what does Melech Sodomus mean? Melech Sodomus means the salt that they added to the Ketores. They added salt that came from Sodom. Sodom, we know, turned into salt. And Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. So I announced loud, Melech Sodomus. And then I was thinking, why did I just shout Melech Sodomus? Like, what, like, why is that like, in, I don't know why I had that afterthought. Like, why did I just excited like Melech Sodomus? And then I was thinking, Okay, that's connected for sure. That's Mashiach. That's literally Mashiach. And I said, why? Because even though Melach Sodom means the salt from Sodom, but the word Melach also can mean king. Although it's a different word, because the word Melach salt is spelled with a ches, and Melach king is spelled with a chaf. But that's only if you're looking, if you're reading inside, but if you're just hearing the word Melach, that's Melach and Melach, but it's pretty close. So Melach means the king from Sodom. Who's the king from Sodom? That's Mashiach. Because King David, it says, God said, I was looking for him. I was looking, Hashem was looking and combing the earth, looking for David Melech. And then Hashem says, I found him buried in Sodom. That's when Hashem extracted Lot and Lot then had relations with his daughters and they fathered the child of Moab. And Moab then becomes the great, 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 great grandfather of Rus. And Rus becoming to Shavuos. And Rus is the convert. And she's the one who carries the soul of Mashiach. Of, of David. So who's Melach Sodomus, the king from Sodom? That's David Melach, that's Mashiach. So I said, wow, that's pretty neat. Um, so the truth is, when we put on uh, Mashiach, the glasses, then everything you see and everything you look at reminds you of Mashiach. Now, why would everything remind us of Mashiach? Simple for a simple reason. <laughs> because everything is Mashiach. Why is everything Mashiach? Because Mashiach is the purpose. And when you make a project and you have a purpose, so the purpose is has to be in every detail of the project. There cannot be any element of the project that is superfluous, that's not part of the purpose. In some things, the purpose is more expressed, and in certain things, the purpose is less expressed. But every little part has to belong to the purpose. If it doesn't belong to the purpose, then it's really superfluous, and it's extras, and, you didn't, and it's a waste. And since this is God's project, and in God's project, there's nothing wasteful, so there has to be Mashiach's signature, literally, just like there is God's signature in everything. There is the purpose that God created the world, which is Mashiach. His signature is on every little detail. And the more we become conscious of the purpose and of Mashiach, the more we see it in everything, like in the middle of davening of Melach Sodom, is the salt of Sodom, and that too is related to Mashiach. In any case, um, so that takes us to the class today. If you had a question of what would be the subject, the subject is obviously going to be Mashiach. Um, I went last where this class grew on me. Last week I was asked to come speak in um, Irvine, California, for Fabrengen. I went there. I had actually a funny story. I like telling my silly stories, but this is what happened. I was supposed to speak at seven o'clock, seven thirty, eight o'clock. Seven thirty was actually. I was supposed to speak for the women a group of women at seven thirty. And at 8 o'clock, I was going to do a Fabrengen, a, a Hasidic gathering for the men, two different things from the same community. So I, because I am very, very good with time, those who know me, um, uh, 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 um, and, 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 and I didn't want to have to deal with my, with my lack of time promptness, I left to go to, the, to, to speak. It's an hour of drive from here. I left literally at 12.30. And I was speaking to 7.30. And my idea was, I'm going to go over there, and then I'm going to go out for a walk, and I'm going to hike. I'm going to find a nice park not far from where it is. I love hiking, as you know. And I'm going to walk out into the wilderness, and I'm going to allow my head to, to like, you know, and, 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 and come up with ideas to speak. I don't like to say the same things over and over again. So I, even if it's a new community that didn't hear old stuff, I like to brainstorm something new. So I came to this, I went to Irvine. I had some lunch and then I went out and I found this park and I was all set and I started off at about 3.30 
and I had a, my, my GPS, this hike. I walked and it was beautiful. It was just, the weather was perfect, blue sky, nice weather. And I left off on this walk and I'm walking, I'm walking. And it was so conducive for like meditative thinking. It, was, it wasn't a hard hike, it was pretty, some like steep hills of up, but it was a very wide trail and it was beautiful and not much people on the trail, it was great. And when I got, the late trail is like a little bit like a loop. When you get to the very end of the trail, you can connect to another trail that is just a walking path that walks on top of the hills and walks. And I asked someone who went by me, how far does this go? He says, you can go like maybe 20 miles on and on and on and on and on. And it was fantastic. And I'm walking and walking and walking and I'm deep in thoughts. I don't even realize the time that's passing and I'm walking and I'm walking and I'm walking. And finally, I'm like, I said, I think it's time to turn back. So I turned back and I start walking back. And I called my wife to tell her how, where I am. I said, this is so beautiful over here. It's really magnificent. And I'm heading now back and I'm going to speak and fine. As I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And this was all extra. This wasn't part of the hike. This was like the extra walk. That wasn't part of the loop that I initially put on my GPS. But I'm not getting to the, to the end. And I was like, this is crazy. How far did I walk? Walking, walking. And finally, I get to that area. I say, oh, I recognize this is the spot where I'm supposed to turn and go back. So I'm moving now. I realize I'm late already. It, by now, it's already 6.30, and I need to get to the car. And then it's a 15, 20-minute drive from there to the, where I'm speaking. So I start running. I'm walking fast, fast. Blah, blah, blah. Then I take out my phone to look to make sure that I – am I on the right path or maybe I missed, went down? I'm on the phone and it looks to me that I see the spot where I'm supposed to turn and it shows me the GPS where I am. So I'm looking to get right direction. So I continue walking, walking it even faster and I'm getting late. So I'm walking fast. And I said, something feels really funny over here. Now let me zoom in. So I zoomed in and sometimes you can't tell if you're getting closer or farther because it's, I zoom in. I realize I'm walking totally the wrong direction. So I turn around, but right now it's already 6.45. So I now I really have to start running. And to Alitsaris, it's uphill. And I walked already like seven miles. Now I'm starting huffing, running uphill, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. <laughs> and I didn't realize how far I had walked off back to the spot where I needed to go back onto the main trail. Now I'm running, <laughs> I'm running through the wilderness, and I realize I ain't gonna be the 715. I don't mean I can't even stop to tell the guy that because I'm so anxious that I'm not gonna be there on time. And meanwhile, it's the middle of a wilderness, so there's a very high brush on the side. Perfect place for a mountain lion, especially at dusk. So you will, the sun is setting, and I'm running. And you know, if you know from time to time, if you read, you see these stories of a mountain lion like attacking someone at dusk, because that's when they, and I realize I'm a perfect target because I'm like, they, I'm running. So I look like I'm moving. So that added in the back of my head. It, it, these stories always happen in the hills of Orange County. So. <laughs> And anyways, at the end, I got to the, I got back to my, to the place, like literally like at eight, at 7.50. And I'm supposed to be already there speaking 7.30. That's because I left to go speak at 12.30. Anyways, but that's where this, this whole class germinated, the ideas that I'm going to be presenting over here. So you have a little bit of the Narishkeit of the background of where this all germinated on me. Back to the class, it's Parshas Kedoshim. And um, the, 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 the parsha begins with the mitzvah of being holy. It says, Kedoshim to you, you should be holy. And um, there is, so it could, the general meaning of it is it's, it's a commandment, be holy. Rashi says holiness comes from a person being careful when it comes to matters of um, relationship. Matters of relationship making sure to have, to be only in a kosher, uh, holy, Torah-sanctioned relationship. For a man and a woman is to get married and uh, to live according to Torah law. Any other form of intimacy is what damages one's holiness. That's according to Rashi. According to Nachmanides, it is a general state of being where a person should not be gluttonous when it comes to all materialistic things. That in, in addition to keeping Torah, one has to recognize that our lives are about a relationship with God, not a relationship with the material physical world for, for self-indulgence and pleasure. It doesn't mean that we should be hermits or be live in a world of abstinence. Torah very much dislikes that. But on the other hand, 
to become overly engaged in materialistic things, even if they're kosher, is a violation of this commandment of being holy. Obviously, it's probably one of the tougher commandments in the Torah, especially according to Nachmanides, because, um, you know, it's a high standard. You know, we're living in a physical world. We have physical temptation around us all the time. Chocolate cake and all kinds of other things come around in today's modern world nonstop because we're, we used to be that people had, what did they have already? You know, onions, black bread, a little herring during the week, a uh, little potato, and that's about it. People lived in extreme poverty. Today we're living in the sushi age. We're living in, in a world where there's so much delights and pleasures all around us all the time. That's part of the messianic prophecy, Madan Mitzuyim Ka'afar. And yet to be able to be a step above it, it's a challenge. It's not easy. Um, but the, here's, the, here's the good news. The good news is besides it being a commandment, it can also be read as a, as a promise. Kedoshim to you can mean you should be holy. Kedoshim to you can also mean you will be holy. Kedoshim to you, you will. It's like, what's going to be? You know what's going to be? The, God says to Moshe, speak to all of me. Kedoshim to you, you will be holy. So it's like a prophecy. It's a determination. And God says, you know why? Because you're my people. I am holy. And therefore you will be holy. Your connect, and what that really means is your connection to me will eventually evolve and catch up with you. So it can be read two ways. Because I am holy and, and I have selected you to be my people and to have a relation with me. So therefore you should work on making yourself holy. But then it can, it also means because you're in a relationship with me, therefore that's the truth and that's your truth and that's our truth. So eventually that truth and that holiness, which means the inherent bond that we have with God will eventually emerge out into the open onto the surface. In other words, the external layers that obscure and cover the holiness will peel away and the holiness inevitably will come out because the truth of something, truth always comes out. You can bury it, you can cover it, you can camouflage it, you can paint it, you can, uh, but eventually, like you have any, if you have a car that's essentially uh, yellow and you paint it uh, green or purple, um, you know, the truth will come out that this is a yellow car. It might take 10 years. It might take 20. If you don't repaint, you just allow it as it is. It will rub off and the external paint will come out and the underlying inherent color will come out. Since the inherent truth of each and every one of us is that we are holy, therefore this holiness will come out. And that's the meaning of Kedoshim to you. You will be holy. So that's a good news because we struggle with holiness. But when we know that our ultimate destiny is that we will be holy, so then, now when will that holiness for sure catch up with us? So that will be in the Messianic age. When Mashiach will come, we won't have any more evil inclination. And the reason we won't have any inclination is not merely because God will knock it off. We won't have evil inclination is because of all the goodness that we have done. All, the, all that, if the truth has to come out. That's what Mashiach is. The underlying truth of the godly truth of existence has to reveal itself because it's the truth of the world, including our inherent godliness. Adam and Eve pretended or, mis or, or misinterpreted who they really are when they started getting materialistic, when they started getting involved in other stuff, Adam and Chava. And when we misunderstood who we are, we misinterpreted ourselves, and, and we're, when we're living in that misinterpretation for, for thousands of years until we come back to our true selves, and that's Mashiach. And obviously the work is being done now throughout a process of self-discovery. When we discover our true essence, we discover we're holy. So Kedoshim to you is a promise. When will all Jewish people be holy? We will be holy when Mashiach comes. And that's why it says in the Gemara that the name of the Jewish people, because it says that our holiness has to be compared to God's holiness. And just like, like the Pasuk says, why should you be holy? Because I am holy. So our holiness is on the level of, like we say in davening, Ein Kadosh Ka Hashem. There is no one as holy as God. And the name of God that we use is Ein Kadosh Ka Yud Ke Vav Ke. 
There's no one as holy as Yud Kei Vav Kei, which is the tetragrammaton. When, and here's the amazing idea. The Gemara says that when Mashiach will come, the Jewish people will be called Yud Kei Vav Kei. Our name will be Havai. What does that mean? What does that mean? We will be Havai. What that means is we're now Havai as well. Because what does it say? Kichelek Havai Amo. There's a the piece, our inner core, the nucleus of our soul is a piece of Yud Kei Vav Kei. It's a piece of God. It's just that what? That it's covered by various different layers that obscure and hide that. That's the klipa, that's the shell. When Mashiach will come, the peels and the shells will peel away. So then our inner inherent godliness will be exposed. So then we will all be Havaya. And when we will all, and Havaya is holy. So we're all going to be holy. And the amazing thing is, we're all going to be living in a world that has every bit of material pleasure in it. But it's not that we won't have them. We won't be defined by them. We won't be captured by them. We will always transcend our material environment around us. And whenever we will do something physical and 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 um and earthy, the heavenly truth of who we are and what we are will dominate that physical experience. So it's similar like when Shabbos, when you're making kiddush on a cup of wine. What dominates? Is it the fact that it's a good cab or it's a good Merlot? Is that the dominating factor of that cup of wine? No, the dominating cup of factor is that God's name has been pronounced. It's Kiddush wine. When you're drinking the four cups um, on Pesach by night, it might be good bottles of wine. If you're lost in the fact that this is a nice bottle and you're just that's your excitement, I mean, you, it's, it's okay to have nice wines. Why were nice wines created? You should use them for mitzvahs. But when that dominates and you're not feeling that this is one of the four cups of redemption and you're doing a godly mitzvah and you're just caught up in the taste of the wine, that's sad. Uh, so it's not that the physical is not there. The physical will be there, but it will be dominated by the content, by the spiritual content. And then we're not, in other words, we're not defined and constricted by the material. It's not, we're not, we're not addicted and trapped by it. We're a master over it. We're expressing our godliness through the physical, with the physical. And even physicality, too, is being permeated with the infinite light that is shining from each and every one of us. And that's the holiness that we will attain when Mashiach comes. So a little better understanding on this concept of the real meaning of being holy and why that holiness will really only be in the days of Mashiach. In other words, even though we've had special people throughout all of history, and Jews were always able to live a more godlier life, yet the ultimate level of Kedusha and holiness will be only experienced when Mashiach comes. Kikadeshani. So we need a little bit of an understanding of the essence of what means holy. So holy means removed. Holy means undefined and separated. Rashi says, Kadesh, Malash, and Muvdal, separated. Avdala, separation. Now, sep real separation means something that is not definable and not graspable. Anything you can grasp is not separated. So, it, 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 you know, when is something separated? I mean, when I can't touch it. So, you know, you have certain things that are, you know, incredible, expensive heart art. They're separated from everybody. Even you go into a museum or something like that, it's, it's, it's kept the way it's hidden. You can't touch it because it's so special. Things that are regular, you can touch. You can lay your hands on things that are extraordinarily special, are hidden behind. You know, they have artifacts that have this, this, this you know, this, 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 this object that belonged to this famous person 3,000 years ago, Alexander the Great. And if you're going into, I don't know, maybe a, a museum in Greece or a museum in Rome or something like that, and they have this artifact because it's so, it has such a value, such sentimental value, such historical value um, that, that it's separated. It's kept, you can't touch it. As opposed to, you know, every you know everybody else's dishes or stuff like that, that anybody can touch because this is, this is in a sense removed because it's special. It's not touchable. Now, obviously, we understand on various different levels when your mind can touch something and grasp something, then it's not really holy because you can grasp it. Separated means your mind can't fathom it. It's bigger. It's untouchable. So the ultimate holiness is. That which is bigger than any mind can grasp. Because we understand that our physical reach is only a small little element of our ability to connect to things. See, what, what we can't connect to physically, certain things I can pick up. I can pick up a, a book. I can pick up this cup. 
But then there is a concept, an idea, a concept I can't fix, I can't touch it physically. So that can't, that means it's it's separated from from the realm of physicality, but it's not separated from from my mind. I can understand it. I can connect to it by learning about it, studying about it, conceiving it, entertaining that idea in my mind. So then I've grasped it. So it's not really separated. So we understand the more abstract an idea is, the more separated it is. But yet the fact that it's possible for someone ever to grasp it means it's not completely separated. What is the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate separation, separated from everybody and everything? Obviously, that's the divine. Because the divine is not graspable. Now, when when we say the divine... We need to understand that within the divine, we're talking about the abstraction of the divine because there is definitely levels of the divine that we, even though all of divinity is holy, but within the divine itself, the real inner, endless, bound, true holiness is within the divine, that which is the abstraction of the abstraction of the divine. For example, let me give a simple example. In the names of God, which name of God do we say is holy? Ein Kadosh Kahavaya. There is no holiness like Yud Kei Vav Kei, which means the other names of God, which is the name Tzavokos, or the name Shakai, Shin Dalid Yud, or the name Elohim, they're holy. Uh, you, you have to treat them with holiness. But Ein Kadosh Kahavaya, they're not as holy as Yud Kei Vav Kei. Why? Very simple reason. All those names are representing godliness that is more interactive with the world. Levels of the divine that are more constricted and more involved and more part of creation. So even though the element of the divinity that's within the creation is something we know intimately, we can touch it, feel it, connect to it, but the godliness that's within creation, we can't really physically grasp the energy that's within something. So it's kind of removed from us, but yet we can conceive it. We can understand it because it's levels of the divine that have already been lowered and have picked where God has self limited himself into certain definitions. And these definitions are conceivable and understandable. So therefore we can't really say it's real holiness, but Havaya, Yud Kei because it's beyond time and space. Havaya means past, present, and future together, which means it utterly transcends time and utterly transcends space. We can only understand with our mind within the context of time and space. So the real experience of beyond time and space, which is the name Havaya, whoa, that's really holy. So Havaya is holy. And that's what it says this week in the parsha: Kedoshim to you be holy, Kikadeshani, because I am holy. Because I and 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 who's who's Ani? Havaya, Kikadeshani Hashem Alokechem, because I God Hashem, Yudkei Vavke is holy. And, and you're and God says, therefore, you know, you're connecting to my holiness, you're connecting to my transcendence. Okay. Now within Yudke Vavke itself, the real holiness of the Yudke Vavke is as you go within the letters and you climb the letters of Yudke Vavke, as discussed many times, the tetragrammaton of God's name could be seen as four letters side by side, or those who have a little bit of studied a little mysticism understand that the letters of God's name are the four letters of God's name are, are, are various gradations of how God lowers himself down from the infinite down to have a relationship with the world. So even Havaya, Yudke Vavke, is related already to beginning to create and set a connection between God and the creation. And where does that connection happen? So the lowest letter of God's name, the last and final letter, which is the Hey of Hashem's name, is the most interactive with the world, the most imminent within creation. It's the source of time and space. And that's the attribute of kingship. God's attribute of kingship, the name of uh, the name of the, the letter Hey of God's name, which is known Kabbalistically as the attribute of Malchus, the feminine element of the divine, is the most invested and the most present within the world. So from all the letters of God's name, it is the least holy. Meaning to say, it's the most attainable, the most connectable, the most reachable. The vav of God's name is holier than the hay, in the sense that it's less 
graspable, that's knowable, because the Vav is, it's actually called in Kabbalah, the He of God's name represents Shekhinah. Now, even though no one is going to say Shekhinah is not holy, we refer to the Shekhinah many times as Shekhinah HaKadosh, the holy Shekhinah. So Shekhinah is very holy. That's compared to the world. But to compare to a level that's beyond Shekhinah called HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Shekhinah is not Kadosh, because Shekhinah is graspable. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Kadosh. Kadosh means removed. So the six emotions of God that precede the hey of God's name, the Shekhinah, that's God's speech. Speech, we can connect the speech. The speech of God, that's what makes our existence. That's what creates time and space. That's what creates all the various different words of God that make up our definitions. So the hey of God's name is the most interactive, the most present, the most imminent, and therefore the least holy, the speech of God. But the emotions that are driving that speech, that's beyond our grasp. That's higher. That's motivating the speech, but it's and driving the speech. And maybe within the speech, there is some of that emotion flowing, but the emotion is too abstract from us. It's too high from us. So the vav is holier than the hay. Now, the hay and the vav are both called the revealed side of God. It's called the haniglos. It's called alma de isgalio, the revealed element of the divine. That means even the vav, which is the abstraction of the emotions that are higher than the imminent speech of God that is the most interactive with the world, even the vav is still the revealed side of God. So where is real holiness? Oh, the first two letters of God's name, the Yud and the He, they're called Alma de Iskasya. They're, concealed, they're called the concealed level of the divine because that's real abstraction. Why? Because they're the divine intellect. And just like when you're talking to a person, I have no idea what your intelligence is, but your emotions I can see because emotions are very much visible to the outside because what a person is excited about, you can't keep it to yourself. Excitement you know, shows itself to the outside. Speech for sure goes to the outside. Emotions are far more communicable, which means they trans they also transmit. Intelligence is kind of your inner world where a person is for themselves. In your mind, you're far more inward than in your emotions. And when it comes to an infinite being, when it comes to God, the inwardness of God, which is... His intelligence is far more removed and therefore much holier. So the vav k, what are you saying? The vav is holier than the hay. The upper hay is holier than the vav. But yet, even the upper hay is not really, really, really removed. Why is even the upper hay not really, really, really removed? Because even the upper hay is called, it's already bina. Bina means understanding. And every element of understanding means it has a ready definition because it's understanding. So even if we're talking about divine understanding, but divine understanding means it has definitions because that's why it has understanding. So it's the divine mind. It's the super mind. It's the boundlessness of intellect, but it's still intelligence. And if it's intelligence, it's already fixed. And we know that it's the source of the emotions. So by, by the mere notion that it's the source of the emotions already gives us some access to it. And we know that, for example, Bina, which is the divine, the upper hay of God's name, it's the divine intelligence, it illuminates the world of creation, the world Olam Habriya, the world of creation, which is the first stage of creation where there are souls in heaven that in Gan Eden, in, 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 the, in the spiritual paradise, in the 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 right in, in, in the in the realm of Eden where the souls are, they grasp God. Why do they grasp? They have it they don't grasp God, they grasp godliness. And what's their source of understanding godliness? Through the element, the hay, it says in, in Kabbalah, that the supernal hay, the upper hay of God's name is what illuminates the world of Bria, and especially the Gan Eden in that world, and souls over there can therefore conceive and understand godliness. So is he beyond or not beyond? Well, he's beyond us, but the souls in heaven, they're grasping, they're understanding. Obviously, there's always more to their understanding. They're never getting to the end of it, but it's still within the realm of the big, you can touch it. You can touch it. As a spiritual soul, you can touch it. So the hay, even though it is the concealed element of the divine, it's not complete holiness. What is really, really holy? Ooh, the yud. 
The Yud of God's name is Chachma. What's Chachma? Chachma is pure, infinite light that is flashing, that becomes like the initial kernel and flash of the energy of the cosmos, of the energy of the divine energy that later spreads into divine intelligence, which later creates divine emotions, which later creates divine speech, which creates the world. What's that first initials flash before it has any definitions and, and therefore it's utterly unconceivable. It's pure a flash of the infinite. What's that? That's the Yud. Wow. No one can understand Chachm. That's why Chachm is called Kach Ma, the power of what? It's the what? We wonder. It's a pella. It's a wonder. It's beyond understanding. We raise our, our eyes up and say, what is that? We don't know it. But it says that even a Chachma, we can't intellectually conceive it, but we can see it. Ria, vision is in Chachma. So souls in Gan Eden can kind of see the light of Chachma, even though they can't understand it. So is Chachma holy? Wow, Chachma is very holy. It's much holier than Bina. The Yud of God's name is super holy. But since it's the beginning of God's name, it's a point. It's the beginning of God's name. And the way that the letters of God's name work, it's not like there is a Yud and there is a He. The Yud is the point, and the point later stretches and becomes a hay. It becomes a shape. It becomes a form. First, it's an undefinable dot. It's just a dot. It's just a potential. Then it manifests as a hay, as a supernal knowledge of God, the supernal intelligence of God. And then it evolves into six emotional channels, super cosmic channels of divine emotions, God's compassion, God's love, God's kindness. God's determination or whatever it is, God's regality and royalty, all the very so the way it works is, is that flash, the yud becomes a hay, and the hay becomes the vav, and the vav becomes the hay. So the yud, by the very nature that it leads into the hay, means that it's not utterly, 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 utterly holy. Meaning it's still what. You can still dream about it. You can't understand it. You can't really grasp it. But you can still abstractly dream. Yitzchak, come on over here. So it's still... Yeah, 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 that's perfect. So it's still, you know, um, 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 you can wonder about it. And by mere by the fact that you're wondering about it, that too means it's not utterly outside of, of, of your touching it. You have a relationship with it by what? By wondering about it. What's the real holiness of God? The real holiness of God is not even the Yud of Chachma, but from where that flash comes from. A flash is a flash, a kernel, a drop of infinite light that drops and becomes the entire cosmic, godly energy of creation. But where did the drop come from? The drop dropped from the sky. With the sky of here, I mean from beyond. From what? From God Almighty himself. As he doesn't have any name, any he can't be expressed by any name whatsoever. Utterly unknowable and untouchable and inconceivable and utterly so high that we don't even know what to wonder about. Because we don't know anything. Because it's pure simplicity on the level of simplicity that doesn't have any whatsoever definition and possible of definition. And that's higher than God's name. Because the Yud Kivav K which represents the 10 sephiro, the 10 attributes, these are all emanations that God emanated of himself. It's almost like Hashem assumes a certain shape and form, personality, so that he can relate to the world and we can relate to him. But there was prior to all of that, and that's the pure infinite light. And where, what's that hint, where is that kind of hinted to? How do we know that that exists? Because in the Yud, if you look at a Yud, the Yud has a little point on the top. And the point of the top is not, the, the oikets of the Yud, this point that's sitting on the top, 
it's indicating something higher. Now, it's interesting. The point itself is not the higher, because if the point would be the higher, then the point itself would be already, you can say, it's the beginning of the dot, so it's not really removed. No, 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 no. It's not the point. The point is just telling you one thing. You should know. But what? I don't know. And words, you don't have any shape for it. You don't even have a dot. You don't know. It's just showing you it's coming from somewhere. Now, that level, Kabbalistically, is called Keter, crown. Because just like, just like the, 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 human, the human being um, has a form, a head, and, and a body, hands, feet, and so forth, we know the divine being above God, as in relationship with the world, made us in his image. So he also has an image. And that's called in the, in the prophets. When they saw God, they saw the supernal man above. They saw an Adam. They saw a man. But the Kabbalists tell us and warn us, we shouldn't take that to be God. God is not, is not a man. There's a verse that says, God is not a man. God is not a man. The answer is, yeah, the attributic range where he lowers himself into attributes. And yes, these attributes are divine. It's not just a attribute. God enters into those attributes. He unifies with the, he emanates them, unifies with them, and he's present within them. The infinite undefinable God is emanating and unified and perfectly one with his attributes. But yet they're attributes. And in the sense, once they're attributes, which means they have already taken on some kind of a form, it's not pure holiness. Holy, which means utterly removed, can only be said on the keter, on the crown. To be more specific, even in the crown, even in the crown of, of God, which means in that infinite, undefinable, pre, pre-spherotic range, pre-attributes, in the pure, utterly unknown element, it explains that there is the external part of it, which is ready a which has in a subtle way a source and a relationship with the 10 attributes that will emerge from it. It's like it has the potential for those attributes. The potential, when God is for himself, but he has the potential to emanate attributes, and the fact that we can talk about a potential for attributes means that there is something there already. So that's not completely holy because we can deduce from the fact that there's attributes, we can at least produce, we don't know who he is, what he is, but we know that he, so much we know that he, he can be a source for intelligence. He can be a source for emotions. He can be a source for kingship. He can be a source. So that is telling us vaguely something. So it's giving us somewhat of a, somewhat of a connection. So it's not complete holy. What is complete holy? Complete holy is when we realize that's not at all him, the fact that he has a potential for these attributes. Who is he? Silence. Not even potential. So, but because we want to talk about it. <laughs> so the Kabbalists gave that level a name. Meaning, in a sense, to, to the essence of God himself. Or to the manifestation of the essence of God, let's call it that one. They gave it a name. It's not their name. The, 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 the name is not made up by the Kabbalists. It's a name that is, so, that is already stated in scripture, in Navi. It's called Atik Yom, Ancient of Days. <laughs> Ancient of days, Atik Yom and ancient of days. And it's referring to God. The prophet says, I saw the ancient of days sitting. And on the ancient of days, the prophet goes ahead and gives a whole bunch of descriptions. <laughs> His garments were white. <laughs> we're, we're saying ancient of days is coming to say that which is undescribed and unknown and unread. But it says the throne was set up and the ancient of days was there and his uh, his garments were like white snow, uh, and the and the hair of his head, like clean, like clean wool. But not, not getting into that, what Kabbalah has to say about that. Obviously, there's a lot, 
in Hasidus talking about this and so on and so forth. Ancient of days. So it, what is ancient of ancient of days is basically what we can't talk about. Because that's holy. But why are we calling it? Just a second. But why are we calling him? Why are we calling him ancient of days? The reason we're calling it ancient of days is the emphasis over here. Reason number one, which is important for us, is that it's ancient. Ancient means it always was. And to say it always was means it what is essentially. What must be. The truth of God that must be. Meaning to say attributes don't have to be. Attributes was a choice that God chose to emanate attributes. And that was for a purpose. For a purpose of a relationship with the world. For a purpose of a connection with the creation. He emanated attributes so that he can design the cosmos through those attributes, with those attributes. He assumes. So these are all divine. But it's divinity that is once was not. If you erase back, 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 back before the decision to create or the will to create a world, there was no emanation of spheros and attributes because they're emanations, which means they before they were emanated, they were not. Every single love, just like the creation is not ancient, it was created. So to the divine forces that are the, the, the energies to create the world are also not ancient. Because they were designed at a certain point in the process of, in some kind of a divine process. The only one that we can say is ancient is the primordial, primordial beginning of beginning of beginning in God himself, which is God's very essence. That's ancient. That always was. Because God is with an absolute existence. That was not born ever. That's ancient of days. Is that level ever revealed to us? Is that level, can we connect to it? We would think that that is completely outside of our, our reach. Because we have to grasp on something. Study, learn, command, mitzvot, connections. It has to do with all the attributes of the divine. Hashem's emotions, Hashem's desires, Hashem wants, and so on and so forth. The essence so here's the, here's the beautiful thing. Since the soul is considered a child of God, God himself says about the Jewish souls, Hashem says, Bonim atem Hashem you are children to God. And we say, Ki havaya amoy, that the, his people are a piece of Havaya, piece of him. That means that when Hashem produces a soul, the soul is godlike because it's coming from God. It's not a creation. It's like Hashem, it's almost like God breaking a piece off of himself. When Hashem pops a piece off from himself, obviously Hashem is not peaceable. But that idea that there's something of him that is becoming a soul, it contains the entire divine structure. Which means, that's why our souls are made, as we spoke earlier, in the image of God. We have intellectual powers. We have chachma. We have, that's the creative flash in our ability, in our minds. We have intellectual power. That's our bina. We have the vav. We have the six emotions. And then we have the malchut, our power of thought, speech, and action to be active and, and, and affect the world. So yud ke vav ke is in each and every one of us. But here's the beauty. In our Yud Kei Vav Kei, there's also that thorn. Within our own Neshama, there's also that little indicator. There's also that little um, pointer that points, which means above the attributes of our soul is our very, very essence of our soul. And our essence of our soul is not our intellectual power. It's not our emotions. It's not our creativity. The essence of the soul is the essence of God. 
that Atik Yomen, that ancient of days. How do you know? <laughs> the sages tell us one of the proofs. The sages say is before God created the world, he, he, he consulted. Before he created the world, he consulted. With who did he consult? With the souls of the righteous. Who are the righteous? We say in Pirkei Avos and Ethics of the Fathers, before we study every Shabbos now, the ethic, we say, Kol Yisrael, Yeshlam Chelek Lolam Abba, Shanemar Va'amech Kulam Tzadikim. Your people are all Tzadik. So when we're talking about righteous over here, we're talking about every single soul is essentially righteous. And God had a discussion with those souls and deliberated if he should create or not create. Now, exactly which point did God have that discussion? We would imagine that if he's discussing if he should create, he discussed it before we even began the project. Because if he didn't know if he's going to create, why would he be? Why would he start the process of emanating levels and levels and levels within the divine if he doesn't even know if he's going to do it? If the whole emanation process, if everything outside of Atik Yomen is not Atik, it's not ancient, it was all added on, it all came about because of the process, and be so that he wouldn't have emanated those levels. I don't care which level it is. It can be the loftiest, highest, most infinite of levels. If those levels are all for a purpose, they all are leading to a creation, and he doesn't even know if he should create or not, he hasn't even decided, then those levels would not come about. That means that the consultation happened when there was nobody there, not even the first emanation. So who was he? Hashem's, Hashem's self and I. Hashem's very self, pre, pre, pre anything, is kind of deliberating with who? But the, at that point, there's no one to deliberate, only himself. And the souls of the righteous. Because the souls of the righteous are him and he is them. And that's a child. The child is your essence. So that means that we really, 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 really have a point within us that is him. And so just like God has attributes, but then there is God himself, the soul has attributes, personality traits, good things, and then there is the soul's very self. And the soul's very self, at its very, very root core, is one with the essence of God. Now, in Midrashic terminology, this idea that there is God and then there is emanations and God himself in again and as much as we're talking about when we're calling it by some kind of a name we call it Keter crown because it's above it's like the it sits above the head which means it sits above the person it sits beyond above above the image of God is the essence of God which is called crown and we said the deepest part of the crown is called Atikyom an ancient of days which is the essence of holiness So the soul, the soul too as well, right? The, in Midrashic terminology, this dimension that the soul has emanations, personality, and then there is the soul itself beyond personality. And again, in God, his personality is hinted to, his primary essential personality is hinted to in his name, which name? Yud K Vav K, the tetragrammaton. That, that's Hashem's evolving he evolves outward to the creation that's his personality so in the soul it's the idea that the soul the four letters of the soul is that the soul has according to the midrash four names the four names to the soul is nefesh soul ruach spirit neshama which which we also translate as soul breath neshama and finally chaya Chaya means it is alive, a living entity. Nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya. Those are the four. And so what are those four levels? What is this? Sorry, why does the soul have four names? Every name is representing another level of soul. Just like we said before that the latter hay of God's name is Hashem's imminence in creation. Hashem's words, when Hashem speaks, his imminence in creation, that's the hay. 
of God's name. Above the hay are the emotions, which the emotions are pre-interaction with the world. And above the emotions is the intellect. And above the intellect is that chachma, that flash. So the same is in the soul. The nefesh of our soul is what interacts with the worldly part of us. What's our worldly part? Our body. So the nefesh is, is the part of the soul that motorizes the body. The nefesh is the saw, source of all physical movement in our body. That's its job. That's why the verse says, the nefesh flows in the blood. Ki nefesh abbasar bedam. The nefesh flows in the blood. The ruach, the spirit of the soul, is already a deeper level of our energy, of our life force, which is more of our emotions. That's the ruach. And what's our neshama? Our neshama is intellect. That's our neshama, our bina, the hay of the neshama. And what's chachma? Chachma is that first initial flash of light, which in our soul, it's a level of soul that is still pure. It's not, doesn't have definitions. It's just a pure energy which is utterly in a state of utter nullification to God, just that that part of our soul is called Chaya, alive. Because on that level, the soul is really alive with boundless life. Four letters of the soul, corresponding to the four letters of God's name, but yet all of these are still definitions. Definitions. Of course, the definition of Chachma is very, very subtle because it's very abstract, but it's still some kind of a level. Higher and deeper than that. The Medrash says the soul has a fifth name. And what's the fifth name of the soul? The fifth name of the soul is called Yechida. Yechida means you, singular. Singular. Yechida means... It's the feminine term for the word yachid. Yachid means the only one. Yachid is referring to the to the level of atik yomen. Atik yomen, the ancient of days, which means God as he is for himself, utterly higher and bigger and beyond and, 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 and removed, and as we said before, pure holiness, as he is removed from all levels, ancient of days, that's called Yahid. He's the oh, because from that level, there's no one but him. Nothing, no creation, nothing exists. There is only one reality, and that's God. And all, as the verse says, the Zohar says, all before him is not. It's as if nothing exists. But it really is. In, on this level, there is there is any, there's not possible anything but him. That's the level of Yahid. In our soul, which is again of the same substance, because it's coming from that level, that inner deepest level of soul that's beyond any definition is called Yechida because she is the recipient of Yechid. In other words, she is the wife of Yechid, which means Yechid and Yechida are one. God and, and, and at that level, God and the soul are one, and there's no definitions whatsoever. There's no specifications whatsoever. There's nothing, we can't even say about it that it's alive. We can only say it's one with God. And that's Yechida. And that's the core, core essence of the soul. Where it is one with Hashem. And that corresponds to the thorn on top of the Yud of our Neshama. And that's the true holiness of the soul. And now we can understand when God says, be holy because I am holy. What's the comparison? We are defined human, material, physical beings, get stuck in the muck on the, and, the, and the mire of life, of the cement of all the stuff of life. What do you mean be holy like you're holy? You're God and we're... Oh, God is saying, that's not you. That's your outer, 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 outer vessel. Yeah, okay, my outer vessel, but my soul also has definitions. Yeah, that's also your outer external. Yeah, but I still have limit, limit, yeah, limitations. And God says, but I know who you are. When we strip away everything about you, I know who you are. You're me. And, and which level of me? On the level of ancient of days. You, are, you and me are one. 
Now, to live on that level, to live on that level of total oneness with God is virtually impossible. So when God is saying, be holy in practical sense, come on. Uh, and Tanya, it explains that when push comes to shove and when God forbid someone wants to take our soul and cut it off from God, this level of our soul emerges. And we cannot separate from God. And that's what drives people to give their lives up to martyr them. Because at this moment, this, this essence is revealed. It's not intellectual. It's not some kind of a, uh, 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 it's not on any level of, of definition which drives people to give their lives up for, for, for not to separate from God. Jewish history has proven when millions of Jews gave their lives up or thousands of Jews who chose. And the Alter Rebbe really explains in Tanya and the uh, uh, monumental work of, of, of Chabad Hasidism is that, the, that, that, this is the, the, that this is not a, it's almost not even a choice. It's like when your essence, when someone is poking at your essence, the essence will come out. And the essence of the Jew is one with God. And at that level, it, it's not a question. It's, he's, he, he or she are inseparable from, from who they are at their core. That's our yechida. Okay, but that's a moment of truth. When That's a moment of truth, but to live that way daily? Can we live in this state of oneness with God daily? And the answer is, for 99.999999 of people, no. Maybe one topic of the generation lives in this state of consciousness all the time. It's not possible. But when Mashiach comes, we will all be there all the time. And that's what it means. You will be holy because Mashiach will come and you will be holy. Why? So we're going to conclude with this one powerful, powerful idea. And this will give us something to really, really, really look forward to Mashiach to where we're ready to come to. And that is as follows. Just like we spoke that there are five levels of soul and, and the ultimate holiness of the soul is the undefiable, undefinable essence of the soul that is one with the essence of God in where, where we are rooted in the ancient of days. We are rooted in the ancient of days. It's essence as it is one with essence. And that's our quintessential holiness. So just like we said, we all have that. There are, in term, in all of history, five super leaders of the Jewish people who manifested, each one was a manifestation of one of these levels of soul. Throughout history, we had five identifiable people who, when you... When you spoke to them or you connected to them, you saw that they were not an ordinary soul. They were the collective soul of humanity and of the Jewish people in particularly. And they, and they represented another one of these five levels of connection. King David was the nefesh of all of our souls. And therefore, King and nefesh is the, the, the nefesh element of our soul is where we connect to God through simple action, which means simple obedience. King David was the personification of simple obedience, of listening to God with a complete surrender to what God tells you to do, because God said so. Because God is the king and you're his subject. And, that's, and we are subjects. And that's the nefesh. What I am sharing with you now is a teaching of the Holy Ariza. In which he says that the great Kabbalist for Yitzhak Gloria, where he says that King David is the nefesh of the Jewish people. Elijah the prophet, Elio Anavi, is the soul. He is the energy of ruach, of emotion. He embodied the emotional range of connection to God. He's the ruach of the Jewish people. Moses, Moshe, he is the neshama. And that's why he brought us the Torah, which is the God's intelligence. And he opened up our ability to connect and cleave to God through intelligence, through our mind. Adam Arishon, and, and the result that I saw today actually says another person, Hanoch. Hanoch was one of the people who ascended to heaven. He became an angel. 
He says he's higher than Moshe, and he attained the level called Chaya. In other places, it says Adam, Adam Arishon was that level, that super level of Chachma, that super level of even beyond intellect, of connection to God through the attribute, through the element of Chachma. But the holy Arizal says the only person who ever is going to manifest and connects to the level of Yechida, which means he represents the collective energy of the connection to God, not to godliness, but to God's very essence, that is Mashiach Tzedkenu. He is the deepest human being ever to live. His soul is plugged into God's very essence, not to any of the attributes or any of the specifics of the divine, but to the ancient one himself. That's what the Arizal says. And let me share with you something stunning. Okay? Believe me if I say it's stunning. It's stunning because Atik Yoman, where is it mentioned? In Navi, where is Atik Yoman mentioned? In scripture. Nowhere. I did a search today. Where is Atik? I put in a Google today. You can look everything in Google. One guy ruined it for me. He's a great singer. I love him. His name is Mati Steinitz. He's got an angelic voice. I'm giving him a plug. I remember heard him the first time. I went crazy. He's got this angelic, beautiful voice. He ruined my search because he made a CD called Atik Yomen. So, you know, when you put in, I put in Atik Yom, and usually I always find right away the first thing. It gives you Wikipedia, and it gives you the Kabbalistic, uh, the, 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 the Pasuk. The <laughs> what, what am I getting? I'm getting 30 entries on the CD called Atik Yom. And he called it Atik Yom because he wants to share that his CD is a CD of old songs, ancient songs, you know, bringing you the oldies. <laughs> So he called it Atik Yomen from the ancient days. It's not one of this new pop music. It's old stuff. <laughs> but it made it very difficult to search. But as far as my search goes, I couldn't find anywhere else Atik Yomen mentioned, only in Daniel. It's all the way in the end of scripture. It's the highest level of the divine. And in, in the word to be, it's mentioned in Daniel. And there's two verses. One of them is in verse, they both appear in chapter 7, verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 9. And the other one is chapter 7, verse 13. Two psukim that speak about Atik Yom in the ancient of days. That level which we explained over here is the quintessence of God himself. Not any em emanation or manifestation. So one of them, the first scripture, the first the first definite, uh, I mean, um, um, entry of Atik Yom in, into the Jewish lexicon is where it's talking about the four beasts. That's the four exiles. The various different beasts that there are, which discussed a few weeks ago. And then it says, a few weeks ago I discussed this in a class, and then it says on the verse number, number 10, in the midst of all this dark creatures that are going to dominate the world before Mashiach comes, it says, <laughs> I saw that they set up thrones, big, big, and the ancient of days is sitting, his garment is like white snow. Sareshe, the hair of his head, like clean, um, clean, uh, whatever, uh, wool. Kursai Shavivin Dinur, around him is like rivers of fire, Galgaloyan, whatever. This is the verse. It mentions Atik Yom. But watch this. Three, ver three verses later, Daniel has a vision of who? Hear these words. I had a vision in the in the in, in a vision, a night vision. What am I seeing? He's appearing with the clouds of heaven. He's a human being. He looks like a human. He's coming from the clouds. The clouds are bringing him and bringing him and they're placing him all the way at which level? He's soaring higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and deeper and higher and higher and higher and endlessly high until he's arriving to the ancient of days. And in front of the ancient of days, they place him. Who is this? This is Mashiach. Daniel is having the vision of Mashiach. And the Devor and the Pasuk is saying that Moshiach is being led higher and higher until he is plugged in to the ancient of days. So this is probably the source of the Holy Ari. The Ari doesn't need sources. He learned with Elijah the prophet, with Elio, with angels, and so on and so forth. They revealed to him the deepest secrets. 
But here it's clear that Mashiach's soul is, is connected to Atik Yomen. And that's the fifth level. As we said, our four worlds. In general, we see everything in the world as four. There is inanimate plant, animal, and human. There is um, um, fire, wind, water, and fire, wind, water, and earth. Four elements, four types of life, four worlds. The world of completion, the physical world, the world of formation, the world of creation, and then the world of emanation, which is utterly divine. Four worlds. But above all these systems of worlds, there is the fifth dimension. And the fifth is holy. Real holiness is only in the fifth dimension. That means what is utterly transcendent, Atik Yomen. And who reaches that level of holiness? That's Mashiach. But Mashiach doesn't reach that so he can be a holy person. Mashiach opens all of us up to that realization. He opens up inside of us our fifth dimension. He opens us, us, us up to a connection to God that's not through just obedience to God, not just through emotions, not just through intelligence, not just through this deep um, inner humility in front of God, but much deeper than that. He opens up the core of the soul where it's our essence is utterly one with Hashem. And at that level, we don't, we're not living in separate consciousness at all. We're living as complete conduits, as complete flow of, of, of God's truth. That's Mashiach. And that's holiness. And, a tr and that's what the verse is saying. The time will come. Now, from that level, one of the verses, one of the things it mentions over here in the verse is that, let's see what continues. It says, Vleyahav Shultan, and Atik Yom in the ancient of days gives him dominion, gives Mashiach dominion, the Yakar and glory, Umalchu and kingship, the Choil Amamaya. And all nations and all tongues, all languages, and everybody will serve him, which means a dominance over all of the entire world. What kind of dominance? This is the truth of God dominating in this world that Mashiach will reveal. When the truth of God is revealed, everybody will be surrendered to God. It doesn't make a difference. Nations, different languages, a universal acceptance, it's not even an acceptance, a universal inherent awareness that's going to open up inherently in all of humanity to see that there is none but him and that he is everything and God is the essence of existence and the essence of life. And automatically, everybody will be surrendered to God and his human revelation in this world, which is Mashiach Tzadkenu. And, and, and it will be a kingdom that will never end. Why will it never end? Because this level doesn't age. Because it's not within time. To really, see, every level that has a beginning has an end. So things wither and age. But when we're talking Atik Yomen, which means removed from time, it's outside of time. What is with absolute existence? And if, that's, if that dimension is present and revealed in Mashiach's kingship and in Mashiach's neshama, then he's outside of the wear and tear of time and of the element of aging. And he enters us all into that level of existence where there is no aging, where there is no, because, because over here where we are, and the, we're living in time, but yet beyond time. Also at this level, Nature and the natural order and the natural system is utterly irrelevant. Because you think about it, all systems that exist, which we call nature, the natural order of the world is all based on more spiritual systems. 
And those systems are based on even more spiritual systems. When things evolve, the Kabbalists speak of a whole system of evolution, where things evolve from the higher worlds to the lower world. These systems go on and on and on and on. But when you get to the very source of where the systems come from, it's all the systems of the 10 sephirot, of the 10 attributes of God's name. But since Mashiach is plugged in not to God's name, but he's plugged into God's very, very essence, on that level, there are no systems. He utterly transcends all systems. And that's why he dominates completely over nature. And that's why when Mashiach comes, Mashiach will have absolute reign over everything. Obviously, it's not Mashiach's reign, but that's the whole point of it, is that he has no entity of his own because he's utterly one and utterly, his entire essence is that he's one with Hashem. There is no beingness. There's no sense of separation at all. And he will usher in the ultimate time of miracles. But at the same time, it won't cancel our world. That's the beauty of it. It won't cancel the world. It will still be a very definitive, definable world with trees and people and sidewalks and maybe cars and 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 all the stuff that go on within the world, yet at the same time. The rigidity of all the rules and regulations and definitions that define the fundamentals of our life of the way it is will not trap us ever. We'll be utterly in a state of transcendence, even when, and that's connected to that level of holiness that we're going to be in. Obviously, in that state, doing mitzvahs and living a life, the godly life, is going to come to us inherently. It's going to be not like a struggle. And it won't, it almost won't even be on a level where we have to consciously choose to do all the things. It will just be who we are automatically. Because once we've uncovered such, once we've identified so deeply with who we really are at our core and our oneness with God, so however God expresses himself through the Torah will be our natural expression when Mashiach comes. Anyways, three quarters of one that I wanted to talk about tonight, I didn't get to. So Be'ezra Tashem, we'll talk about it at another time. But at least we got through some of this idea of holiness and the true holiness that we are awaiting for. And we got to talk, meanwhile, a little bit about Mashiach and about how special things are going to be Bezrat Hashem very, very soon. So everyone have a good week and we should see Mashiach today.